So I was asked to take a look at this by a couple of friends and I was not disappointed in the slightest. This is Malignant by James Wan, director of hits such as Aquaman, Conjuring 1, Conjuring 2, Insidious 1, Insidious 2, and other films that I haven't seen by him. I like him though. He's he made the the ones that I listed. I liked. I liked Insidious One. I really liked Insidious Two. I liked Conjuring One. I liked Conjuring Two, and I really liked how campy Aquaman is. And Malignant feels like he took all of the good things from what he's been good at from those previous films, and brought it all together. The camp from Aquaman. And the horrorishness of its cities and conjuring into *Malignant*. Now, *Malignant* is a film that I actually did do a fair bit of looking into prior to making this little video here. I actually looked into various, <laughs> but let's just say that this film has a very divisive community. People either really like it, or they really don't like it, or they don't understand how or why this film got made on the budget that it has. And a lot of it is valid. But personally, I'm on the side that likes it more than the side that doesn't. Because <laughs> I like schlock. I like I like schlock. I I I I I love the evil bong. I love the ginger dead man. I love critters, gremlins. I like all that crap. <laughs> well, gremlins is actually a genuinely good film, but in that vein, killer clowns from outer space. In that vein of that campy horror that knows exactly what it is. With that aura, that aura of a James Wan movie, that's what Malignant is. And I was told, apparently, James Wan wanted to make a movie that gave up the vibe of a 1980s flick that you would find in a VHS rental store on the back shelves forgotten about by everybody who goes there. It's where you would shove something and just leave it there. Um, such as drive through if you've ever heard of that. You probably haven't. But those types of movies that go forgotten in the back of the schlockiest of schlock. That's the type of movie he wanted to make. And I dare say that he succeeded. This isn't a movie that intended to break any boundaries. It didn't intend to break any extraordinary, amazing, oh wow, this is the biggest thing ever. No, it didn't want to do that. It wanted to go and take a few steps back while being a few steps forward at the same time, and it succeeded on both accounts, but I would agree that it could have been more campy, but it also could have been more not campy. It wasn't campy enough, and it wasn't serious enough, but god dang, I don't care, I loved it. This is Malignant, directed by James Wan. The DVD, whatever. It's rated R, because there's a lot of R here. Um, a new Vision of Terror, it's not new. It's not, it's not new. Um, Malignant has a lot of things that remind me of a lot of things. Such as a very, very obscure film called Basket Case. Now, if you... Want to know why it's related to Basket Case? We'll have to talk about the film itself for a fair bit. Our film opens with some sort of hospital where 
everything's blown over dramatic proportions in the amazing way of a schlocky B movie. <laughs> the acting's all B movie. Everything, everything is B. Okay, everything is B. It's not going to be A-list actors, dramatic, Oscar-worthy performances. If you're coming in here, watching this movie, expecting Oscar-worthy performances, you'd better turn the film off right now because you're not going to get it. Don't come in here expecting The Conjuring. Do not come in here expecting uh, Critters. <laughs> you're not going to get either one. You're going to get something a little bit in the middle of the, both of those films. It's not campy enough to be a terrible B-movie 1980s, but it's not good enough to be, like, oh, well, good. What's the best way to say good? Um, proper horror, proper, proper good, good, whatever. I'm not following that line of thinking because it's probably going to take me a few minutes to figure out what I'm trying to say. We open with the campy hospital where everybody's going, He has psychic powers! He can absorb electricity, blow people away! And people are being thrown out of a hospital room. And so the director of the doctor people goes in there and says, It's time to cut out the cancer! And so she cuts out the cancer of whatever that is. We, tr we pan the screen over to a curtained little room where everybody's screaming where everything was happening and there's this little creature thing majiki behind the thing we can barely see what it is and then we skip forward to a lady coming home from like and she's in the uh, this nice little tiny little quaint suburban house and somebody else has brought this up before but the outside and the inside of the house do not match that's part of the course. A lot of films usually have a house on the outside that they shoot. They pan around a house that looks nothing like what you would expect to be inside that house when they actually shoot it. This is one of those that's a little bit more glaring, but if you have an eye for that type of critical detail, you're not coming into this movie with the correct mindset. You're just not. Do not come in here to critique a triple A list film. Just don't. Come in here expecting to see something on the schlocky level of critters made by somebody with the prestigious level of Insidious. It's more to Insidious than it is to Conjuring, though, okay? It's more to Insidious than it is, would be to Conjuring. Since Insidious had plenty of camp, too. But this has more camp than Insidious, but not as much camp as critters. Yeah! So the lady who comes home... She's pregnant, and her significant other is a very abusive, evil, meanie man. And the meanie man, the man, he's watching television, and the lady, she seems to be wearing scrubs. I guess she might be working in a hospital. She might be a nurse or something. Who cares? Because the film doesn't care either. So she say, turns off the TV, and she wants to lay down. As you do, you're pregnant and you have had a long day and you want to lay down. But the mean man is having none of that. He was watching whatever was on the television because apparently there's no television downstairs for him to go down and watch without making a fuss. Because he has to make a fuss. Everybody's got to make a fuss. I was watching that! So, this is why you don't watch cable. If you can't just pause it and continue it in another room or something, you're not watching it correctly. Whatever. So they have a fight, and the mean man shoves the pregnant lady's face against a wall. And there's a big, big, big good sound effect. There's very good sound effects in this, in this film. Like, sound is very well shot. The camera work is very well shot. There's a lot of innovative, nice-looking camera pans and overhead views. Everything looks very pretty. It looks very pretty. So... The mean man shoves the woman's head against the wall, and there's a nice bone-cracking crack sound when you bang into the wall. And you see that there's an indentation on the wall. That was a big impact, and you see some blood. He, he drew blood, and then he suddenly realizes that he probably shouldn't have been mean like that. And he starts to apologize, as you do, too late. And she shoves him out of the ha out of the room. He goes to get some, some band-aids or whatever, <laughs> and she locks the door behind her. Um... She's wearing scrubs, and she seems to be, like, uh, a doctor person. Not doctor person, but working with doctor people. So somebody with medical experience like this would probably think, 
Oh, I should probably take this look that I might have a concussion. But no, she just locks the door and sleeps it off, as you do. And as she's sleeping it off, the uh, mean man, the hospital mean man um, downstairs, he sleeps downstairs for the night. There's a creepy creepy going around downstairs, and he's going to be dealing with that for a while. Something's in the kitchen. He goes and sees there's a blender on. Nobody turned the blender on. He turns it off. The fridge door is open. Nobody opened the fridge door, so he closes it. And then there's some other spooky stuff that happens. Somebody's watching TV or some shit like that. And he's like, oh, is that my wave? Blah, 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 blah. But then he goes and sees. He turns the light on. There's nobody there. The TV turns off again. And then the, the lights, whatever, flicker again, and there's something behind him that kills him. And he just dies. Because, of course, <laughs> he's got to die like that. But th this opening segment isn't campy. It's not, like, super campy. It's the type of stuff you would see in a contract film. It's the type of stuff you would see in something like that. So this might start to garner your expectations to thinking, oh, this might be something similar to how he directed the Conjuring films, but you'd be you'd be wrong, you'd be wrong. But that's the that's a problem I would say that this film has is that it has two different halves to it that have two very different tonalities. Let's say this half here on this half is the conjuring. We're just going to say con right there. Let's say this half is the conjuring half that has typical conjuring tropes like the hauntings and all that crap. So there's something watching TV. There's nobody there, though. There's somebody turning the blender on, but there's nobody there. There's somebody opening the fridge, but there's nobody there. That type of spooky, creepy, making the electrical crap happening, that's going on here. And then there's the level of camp. We're going to call this the camp section. The camp. Yeah, the camp, right? So there's the camp over here. And the camp hasn't happened yet, but we've had one conjuring tick so far, which is a trope. After the man dies, the police people come to investigate. And they say that somebody broke in, somebody probably broke in, they killed a man, and they roughed the girl up a bit. She wakes up in the hospital, and they had to exercise the baby from her belly. She, she it was dead. And this, we learn, was her third or fourth attempt at trying to have a baby each time she would have a miscarriage. And it would, it would fail. And now she starts to react in a way that you would probably expect to react to one of those B-movie horror films from the 1970s and the 60s. So we're going to call that a camp reaction. Afterwards, she meets the policeman man, and we're going to call him K, because that's what everybody calls him. The policeman K and his partner, Miss uh, Snooty Pants. That's her name. Miss Snooty Pants and K go to ask her some questions about the intruder and all that stuff, and they start to investigate what's going on, and the, the, her story doesn't exactly check out the way that they expect it to, right? So, then, so now we switch perspectives sometimes between the lady and the investigative K-man, and we learn that the lady has a sister. The sister is also there worried about worried about her and they and they have family moments there and investigator man starts investigating other killings that are happening because there's this thing that's going around killing people now and we might be suspecting that it could be the same person that killed the lady's mean man husband man so now they're starting to suspect that whoever's the killer killing around these doctor people and all that crap might be related in some way to the lady so Kay is starting to suspect that, and Miss Snooty Pants definitely suspects that, but Kay is starting to get fancy with the sister of the lady person. And so he's being a bit nicer to them. And then he gets into an encounter with the crazy trench-coated killer. Now we get to see that the trench-coated killer definitely kills people, and he moves a bit strangely. 
it almost his limbs move a little bit stiffly a little bit it's like he can't bend his arms properly his legs don't bend the way they're supposed to it's very strange and if you do the second half of the film you might be you you know why he's moving strangely but since we don't know this answer yet, we just think, oh, he's just some creepy dude with some creepy powers, right? Why does he have electric powers? Why can he speak through the intercom systems and all that stuff through the electrical waves? Is he psychic? What's going on? Well, if you're expecting answers to any of that, shame on you. You're not going to get any of that because this is camp. <laughs> So, the creepy man killing all these things, these killings and all this stuff look like the stuff that you would get out of a B-movie slasher. Fun stuff! So now, Kay inspects all the dead people, and then the lady starts to have dreams of the people that this person is killing, right? So she tries to report the latest kill that she just had a dream of. So Kay goes to this guy's apartment and finds the dead body. So now, Miss Snooty Pants definitely suspects that the lady is probably the killer. She probably is the killer. B -b motive for the mean man, motive for the doctor, peep person. So now they start investigating her. And she starts investigating her own past and her connection with all this stuff. And then she learns about the name Gabriel, because this creepy voice person that speaks to the intercoms tries to contact her. And then she says, Gabriel, blah, blah, blah. So she goes to talk to her mother, which we learn is her adopted mother. And the sister is her adopted sister. And she learns from the adopted mother that she used to have an imaginary friend named Gabriel. And Gabriel used to make her do things. Creepy things. And they made her a little bit uncomfortable, right? So we're beginning to suspect she might be a little bit kooky. She might be a little bit crazy. So she might have, like, an alternate personality, right? So maybe they might be insinuating that she has an alternate personality named Gabriel, who has psychic powers, who can suddenly be, be, be become taller and uh, throw things with, like, psychic precision, with super strength to climb on walls and all that strange and creepy shit. And... It's, it's, it's really, really, you wouldn't suspect that from this lady. You wouldn't suspect that from, as a viewer. You wouldn't suspect that she might be this, right? So you're di in disagreement with Miss Snooty Pants. But Kay is trying to figure that out. He gets into an encounter with this man in the subways or whatever, the underground undercity of Seattle. I think it's Seattle, yeah. It takes place in Seattle. There's an undercity, like they built an old city in the 1800s, and then they built another city on top of it after a bad flood. So, there's that. And I liked that idea. I don't think we've seen anything there before, and if we have, or if I've seen anything, I've definitely forgotten it. But it's interesting, at any way, to say the least, I like this set piece, this underground, undercity, with all this creepy crap happening under there. I want more stuff to happen in under cities. I would like more things to happen there. So this creepy guy starts killing Gabriel, we're gonna call him. Gabriel has this strange powers, and he encounters Kay, and they have a little fight, and all throughout the picture, you're, you're thinking, well, Gabriel has had hundreds of chances to kill Kay at every single moment. Why are you fleeing? Like, every as soon as you as Kay, Kay loses sight of you, you can hide in the shadows. Kay runs forward looking for you. You come out and you kill him. But no, no, Gabriel doesn't do that. He, you do, he, Gabriel isn't exactly logical in this regard. Gabriel isn't exactly smart in this regard. There, that's a little bit better, isn't it? Okay, so... Where were we? I had to cut for a second there. Um... So Kay encountered the creepy man, Gabriel, in the underground system of Seattle. And now he starts to suspect that it's not going to be the girl, because clearly she can't climb on walls and do all that supernatural shit. 
But Miss Snooty Pants doesn't believe that Kay encountered whatever it is he encountered down there, because it was pretty dark, and maybe he encountered something else, or maybe he just imagined all that supernatural crap that he that Kay claims that he's seen, and Miss Snooty Pants is still gunning for the lady who who was pregnant, whatever her name is. Um, Madison, that's her name. Her name is Madison. Wow, I'm very proud of myself. I normally can't remember people's names. I really can't. I really can't. Now, it's at this point, after the underground scene in Seattle, where we completely destroy this. Okay? We're going to completely destroy the Conjuring thing. And then we're going to go back into, say, the early 2000s era. We're going to go into the early 2000s era, because we're now going to have an investigating scene. Um, our characters are going to split up and investigate Madison's past and who she used to be before she was adopted. So, the sister goes into, uh, let's see, they go to this asylum place, this hospital or whatever, where they found, uh, Madison. They adopted her or whatever. And they find a box and records that are, that's tropically in the basement of this spooky, abandoned, um, giant hospital asylum on the edge of a cliff. <laughs> you can't make this shit up. <laughs> so it's on the edge of a cliff. It's spooky little manor, right? And she, uh, the sister finds the records for Madison. And we find her name used to be Emily, right? And then she was born from a 15-year-old girl who was um, forcibly inseminated by an unknown assailant. So this mother, who was 15, gave the child up to the hospital and just fled afterwards. After she was deemed psychologically sound of mind to give up the child and all that crap or whatever. So she leaves. She she leaves the the child here. And we learn that it's not actually one child but two children. And that she actually has a sibling named Gabriel. But it's not exactly the type of sibling you would expect. Maybe it's a twin. Like, maybe she has an evil twin. And it's a bit, um... It's a bit more than what you would expect out of an evil twin. Because if you just expect a, a, a typical twin that uh, looks identical to her, that somehow has psychic powers and all that crap, you would be wrong. This evil twin is a conjoined parasitic twin. A malignant parasitic twin growing out of the back of her skull. It's very, 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 very good effects there. It was <laughs> so they, they, they realize that this malignant twin is feeding off of all of the nutrients that Emily is eating, and she's growing frail. Since she has the dominant body, they decide to carve out Gabriel from the twin. So let's say this is her body, right? Let's say that's her body right there. And let's say this little circle here is Gabriel. He, he's growing out of the back of her head. Now, they share a singular brain, but the body part the doctors were able to carve out. They were able to carve out Gabriel's body. But they can't exactly carve out the half of the brain that belongs to Gabriel, because that might kill Emily. So they just shove... They just shove the brain... The, the, they shove the brain into the head... Into the head of Emily, and they just... They close it up. They, they close it up. They close the head up. And, and, and they, they think that, that they think that'll do it. They think that'll keep Gabriel out of, out of, out of trouble. <laughs> That's a, I'm gonna call that a camp. <laughs> I love that they, you cannot expect this to be logical in any way, shape, or form, or scientifically sound. We've already thrown science out the friggin' window when we have this Gabriel twin being psychic and can use electric powers and has super strength and all that stuff. Uh, so, we learn that Gabriel has reawoken inside Emily slash Madison's brain. And Gabriel can control her body, but not 
in the way that you would expect. Like, like, like possessing somebody's body and then walking forwards. Walking forwards, taking control of... The, no! No! Since Gabriel was growing out of the back of 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 um, of Emily's skull c c clearly the back of Emily's skull will break open and the brain <laughs> Gabriel's brain that has an eye and a mouth will smush out of the of the, of, of the back of the back of the skull and and and, and, and take control and make Madison walk backwards. Move backwards. And she, she's she's walking backwards. <laughs> I loved it. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Uh, uh, oh my gosh. Oh my. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. That was amazing. That that that, that, that scene where we first see this happen is in a jail cell because. There's a body, a, a lady who is trapped in, in, in Madison's attic. Gabriel put her in, in, in her attic. And so they think, oh, Madison must have put this lady tied up in the attic, right? So they imprison her and while they go investigate the Gabriel crap that Emily and the sister have, insin have, have insisted is true. So he's out going checking for that crap. Kay's out doing that, and, and, and Snooty Pants is with him. And then, and then, and then the ladies in the prison area and and all the evil, mean convict ladies start to to mess with her. And they all look completely out of time. You don't know what time period this film is set in. You don't know. Could this be set in the seventies? I I know. Some people have like these smartphones, so. One of them looks like she came right out of the 60s. Afro and all. It just, they all. So they're all mean to Madison. They're all mean to her. And all this meanness awakens Gabriel from the back of Madison's head. And he comes out of her skull. He, 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 he comes out of the back of her skull. And, and everybody dies. <laughs> Everybody, everybody, everybody just gets, it, 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 say there's, everybody's all over here, everybody's in this room, so many convicts are in this room, and she just goes boom, boom, she just smashes everybody in evil, blowing fashion, and of course there's no guards. Every time these people start to scream at the, 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 at the, at the gate for the guards to come, nobody's coming, all of the screams and death, there's, the, the, Logically, this would not happen. There would be a guard posted within earshot at all times, right? They might ignore you, but somebody should be within ear. Somebody should be there in your holding cell to hear you when you're shouting and screaming in pain and in agony. So she's killing everybody here. Everybody is... Everybody! And of course, by the time everybody has been killed, that's when the guard comes. That's when the guard comes, and, and, and he sees, oh my goodness, all the people are dead. And so, and then, and then and then Gabriel gets the guard, he gets the keys, and he opens the gate, and he comes out. And then we are in another room with the, all the police desks. All the police people are here. There's a desk, 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 desk. It's a massive, massive, massive metropolitan police station in the suburban city. But this is Seattle, so of course it's a big, 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 big one police plaza, right? Lots of desks, lots of cops. Everybody is armed and ready, armed to the teeth with shotguns and pistols. Everybody's ready to go, and they're all aiming at Gabriel. And then in this scene, this magnificent, awesome, famous, ugh, he just destroys everybody, everybody, everybody is dead, everybody gets slashed apart, bodies go flying, arms get thrown at people, he punches his hand through somebody's body, and just, everybody's gone, everybody, everybody is gone, <laughs> and Kay and Miss Snooty Pants show up and see this incredible array of carnage, and, and they try to take part and try to help out, but of course they're 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 they're, they're useless. And so 
at the in, on the other side of the freaking police plaza. They're trying to get through this door. They're over here trying to get through the door, right? And then and the Gabriel's over here. The backwards man is over here, and there's a chair here, and he picks it up <laughs> from behind, and he spins, and he throws it, it goes, and he whams the back. <laughs> Bullseye! <laughs> they're dead. <laughs> they're not dead. They're not dead. But they're very. One of them is heavily incapacitated. Miss Snooty Pants is heavily incapacitated. So it is up to Kay to go to the hospital where the lady who fell from the roof is in medical care. And that's where everybody assumes Gabriel's gonna go to take her out, right? So Madison and her sister. K, everybody's converging on the hospital room. So everybody has converged into the little hospital room. We have Madison and the sister in here with the lady. And then Gabriel breaks in, and K and then they the, the, the Madison turns in. The Madison turns into G Gabriel's with Madison and all that stuff. And and, and they're trying to. And the sister and Madison are trying to talk, and they, they're saying, "You can wake up in there, Madison. Wake up in there, Madison." And then and, and Madison's like, "Oh, I can't do that. Oh, I can't do that." And Gabriel's like, "Ah, you bitch!" And then K comes in, saying, "Watch out! Shoot! Shoot! Shoot!" Gun, 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 fire, fire, fire. Then Gabriel just swams K around. He, K goes flying into the wall. And then he throws a hospital bed at the sister, pinning her to the wall. And then so, and then we have an internal battle between Madison and Gabriel in the brain space that they share. And it's like, we share the same brain, Gabriel. I'm done letting you take over my body. I'm going to trap you in a mental prison. You're going to be in here with guards and gates and all that stuff, you're locked in there. And then Gabriel's like, you can't do this to me! And then she leaves her mental prison and wakes up, and, 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 and then Gabriel's face goes inside her skull again. It goes back inside the skull, and she and she walks over to the sister who's been pinned under a hospital bed, and she has super strength now, and she lifts the hospital bed, and the sister hug, they, she and the sister hug, and, and everything's happy again. The camp, uh, the, 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 the camp, um, the camp here here is it, it just it just it just oh my goodness camp wins there's so the second half of this film is full of so much camp shot like it's from aquaman okay now james wan directed aquaman he had some good interesting fight scenes those fight sequences the way he shot those fight sequences is how the these sequences the slaughter sequences in the second half of this movie were shot it's it's like an action movie it's like aquaman shooting with all that stuff you don't normally see that level of carnage you wouldn't even see it in killer clowns from outer space you wouldn't see that in that level of detail, in that level of gore-tastic, gruesome-tastic, but, but, but it, it just works. It works in that way. The second half of the film definitely feels exactly like what James Wan tried to do. He tried to make a B-movie that would be found in the 80s on the back of a rental movie shop, right? That's exactly what the second half of this film felt like. There's parts of it that feel like it came from the early 2000s. There's parts of it that feel like that remind you, like the opening sequence, that remind you that this is James Wan who is directing this. So, it's like an amalgamation of... of of two major periods of, of, of horror, the slasher horror in the 2000s, early 2000s type of investigative type of horror, like the ring and all that crap where everybody has an investigating scene, we have to investigate, learn about the history, whatever the crap's going on, and blah blah blah, so there's an investigative scene, there's a bunch of carnage, crappy, campy, 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 camp, 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 that's not supposed to make any sense, because if you even try to make sense of what you're seeing, you're not going to make sense of it. Stop trying! Just stop trying! Okay? That's why you don't like it! You tried to make sense of it, and you're not gonna do it! You're not gonna succeed! You're not! Malignant is an insane film, and it's very entertaining. It is very entertaining. I had a lot of fun with this movie. I can tell why it's so divisive. I completely understand why it is so divisive, but I don't care. I loved Malignant. 
This video is 34 to 35 minutes long. I didn't expect it to be this long, but it's worth talking for 30 minutes about. Go watch Malignant. It's imaginative.